it's uh, appropriate that we are uh, finishing up our study on spiritual warfare on Veterans Day weekend. Uh, there's one thing that every Christian is, and that is that we are veterans of a war that has been going on for a very long time, but is now coming nearer to a close. And the topic today is about a person's battle posture in spiritual warfare, our battle posture. Your posture says everything about you. I don't know if you've ever thought about that. Uh, you either display confidence or the lack thereof by how you hold yourself. Uh, you, if your posture is good, your breathing is easier and deeper. Um, if your posture is good, it improves your circulation and believe, that, believe this or not, but according to what I read, it improves your digestion if your posture is good. Uh, and here's one we'll like. It makes you look slimmer if you're uh, standing straight and shoulders back. And uh, it also makes you look younger if, you're, if you have good posture. Of course, you guys, you don't have to worry about that. They're young. They're young right now. Uh, it reduces stress on the muscles and joints, and it affects your frame of mind. Uh, if you're all slumped over, uh, that kind of makes your mind kind of slumped over. And the last one, number seven, it makes for a healthy spine. And uh, that would be great, so I guess people that are politicians really need to do this because I'm not sure if some of them even have a spine. But uh, what about the spiritual aspect of uh, our posture? Turn to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. I want us to look once more at three different sentences here, three different verses that the Apostle Paul gives, 11, 13, and 14. Paul says, put on the panoply of God. That's the armor. That's all the accoutrements. Panoply is the Greek word, and it means all the things that a soldier wears and takes with him. Put on the panoply of God for you to be able to stand. That's one of the words I want us to look at. To stand against the artifices or the methods of the slanderer, the devil. Because of this, verse 13, Paul goes on to say, because of this, take up the panoply of God. Now he's repeating himself. That you may be able to stand against in the evil day and all things having worked out to stand. Now oh, that's interesting. This is twice in one verse he talks about standing. And then in verse 14, stand therefore, having girded about your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. So four times in three verses we are told to stand. Let's pray. Father, we do ask for your understanding and your help in not only understanding your word, but applying it to our lives. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I find it interesting about the choice of the words that Paul used. And I want to again state that the Holy Spirit was choosing the words for Paul, through Paul. Uh, this is not just the thoughts of a man. 
And so the choice of the words is important. Why did Paul choose the word stand when he's talking about putting on armor, being a soldier of Christ? Why didn't Paul say fight? I mean, you could see there, put on the armor of God for you to be able to fight against the methods of the devil, of the slanderer. What the devil means slanderer. Or, I've often thought too, you know, of course I used to watch the westerns when I was a little kid. They used to show all the old John Wayne and everything on TV. And whenever the cavalry would come over the hill, uh, they would be saying, Charge! Well, why didn't Paul say, Charge? Well, the question about the battle that we are in is this. What kind of battle are we in? Are we fighting against restless uh, indigenous peoples? Uh, what, what are we fighting? We're fighting the enemy, a fallen angel, very powerful, very evil, nothing good in him at all. Are we fighting blood and flesh, as the Apostle Paul said? Then why would Paul use a military term if we were not fighting blood and flesh? And see, that's the issue. We're fighting a spiritual war and we are fighting spiritual beings and that's why he doesn't say to uh, our posture, when he talks about our posture, he talks about standing, standing. You see, our victory depends on our location. You know, you talk to a real estate agent, they'll tell you, well, the three most important things are location, location, location. Uh, well, the most important thing for a Christian is to understand our location and we are found in Christ. If we were to take ourselves out of Him, if that were possible to do, we would be uh, toast, spiritually speaking. I want you to go back to some scriptures uh, in the Old Testament that talk about posture. I want you to go back to Daniel chapter 10. Daniel chapter 10, verses 12 to 14. Now, this Daniel is recording about a dream that he had had and that he really had set his heart to understand what that dream meant. And so another angel was sent to him to give him the understanding, the interpretation of that dream. And Daniel records this. Then he, that's the angel, said to me, Do not fear, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and you were humbling yourself before your God, your words were heard. And I have come for your words. But the leader, and most English translations say prince, but the word also means leader, and in Hebrew that's the best way to understand it is leader. But the leader of the kingdom of Persia stood against me 21 days stood against me. Now, a lot of the English translations do not say stood against me, but that's what it says in Hebrew. Stood against me. But behold, Michael, one of the first rulers. Now, I found that interesting, too, because in the English transla translations, it says one of the chief priests, the chief, chief princes, I'm sorry, chief princes, uh, but that's 
what it says in Hebrew is one of the first rulers came to help me and I stayed there with the kings of Persia now I have come to make you understand what will happen to your people in the latter days for the vision is yet for days in other words in the future so what we have described by an angel is a a um, a battle that's going on between an angel that that is fallen that works for the enemy and might have been an angel might have been a demon I don't know demons of course you know are the progeny the the children of fallen angels according to Genesis chapter 6 and so uh, that was the spiritual battle that was going on and it went on for 21 days three weeks three weeks and he stood against him stood against him now you think well how is standing against somebody what does that mean well now I want you to turn back to Genesis Genesis chapter 32, verses 24 to 28. Now, you will remember that Jacob had been on the run from his brother Esau for some time. And Jacob was now getting ready to go back into the land of promise, leaving his father-in-law and, uh, and going back into the land of Israel course it wasn't called the land of Israel yet it was called Canaan and Jacob was left alone now Jacob is in the desert he's moved all his family and his goods he's put them in a different place and he is left alone and a man wrestled with him until the rise of the dawn. Now again, some of the English translations do not say wrestled, but the Hebrew specifically says wrestled with him. Wrestled with him. And he saw, and by the way, the he is the man, and interestingly enough, in uh, this text, when it translates it to English, capitalizes the H. The H. Why would they do that? Because Jacob later says, I saw the face of God. So the man that he was wrestling was God. And he saw that he did not prevail over him again one of those words in the English translation say against him and you say oh preacher come on you're you're splitting hairs no I'm not not splitting hairs because you see a lot of folks have the idea that God when we deal with God he's against them he's not against us but he is over us and that's the correct understanding of this passage. He saw, God saw, that he did not prevail over Jacob. So he struck him on his hip socket. So the socket of Jacob's hip socket was unhinged as he wrestled with him. And he said, and this he is the man, okay, not Jacob. And he said, send me away for the dawn has risen. And Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. We need God's blessing. Jacob knew it. 
And he said to him, that's, that's God is speaking to Jacob, what is your name? Now, yeah, I want to pause there. God knows everybody's name. There's a reason he asked the question. Because Jacob's name meant supplanter or someone who was trying to con you, I guess would be the way of putting it today. So Jacob said, well, my name is Con Man. Okay. And, of course, Jacob said, that's what my name means. And then God said to him, your name shall not be any longer called Jacob, Con Man, but Israel. Israel means a prince of God. For you have contended with God and with men and have prevailed. Now you're probably saying, well, okay, preacher, now you started off talking about standing and then you talked about wrestling. Why? Well, because of Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, God's Word tells us because the wrestling is not to us against blood and flesh, but against principalities, that's the word that's translated as rulers, against authorities, against the world rulers of the darkness of this age, against the spiritual powers of wickedness in the heavenlies. Now you see what I'm saying here, the Bible is showing us that we're in a struggle, that we are standing against spiritual forces, that we are wrestling. Now you say, wait a minute, now when I was in school, uh, they got us down on all four and we would have to put our, our hand on the other person's shoulder and we wrestled them that way. But you see, that's not the way most wrestling is. They used to have a term called Indian wrestling. I know that's not politically correct, but that's what they called it. And the wrestling that the Native Americans did was very much like the wrestling that the ancient world people did, and that is you wrestled standing up. You ever see sumo wrestlers in Japan? They wrestle standing up. And the option, uh, the, uh, the objective is is to either, well, for sumo, is to throw them outside the ring, or it's to knock somebody off their feet and leave one person standing. Standing. In a wrestling match, we can learn three things. Three things. The wrestling that you and I do as Christians, spiritual wrestling, it's first intense. It is intense. It's not easy. I don't know if you've ever noticed, but sometimes you will see where two well-matched individuals, then they're wrestling, that for a while it's just they're just standing there grunting have a hold on one guy's neck the other one on an arm and they're barely moving because they're looking for leverage they're looking for an opportunity and you say not much is going on but oh there's a lot going on there there's a lot of strain that's going on you see the only way for us to prevail in a match with the enemy is to remain unmoved in Christ because that's who we are in is we are in Christ Jesus tells us that Christ is our rock he is our foundation and as Christians we can never ever leave him our struggle is against evil, not God. Jacob had to learn that. We have a struggle against ourselves, 
You ever doubt about whether God is going to take care of you? You ever wonder about things that you know the Bible says God's promised that? Well, that's a struggle against ourselves because we're the ones that are doubting. So we have to refuse to move and we have to refuse to think or doubt or worry about the things that are bothering us. But that's part of the wrestling. That's part of it. We have to stand in Christ. Look in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. And as I mentioned before, these, I, I'm giving the literal translation of these scripture verses. But the Spirit set specific terms. Now, that's the literal translation of the word that is defined differently in a lot of English translations. Sometimes they say, the Spirit expressly says, or the Spirit specifically says. But the word is actually kind of a legal word term, which means that certain conditions are set. Certain conditions are set. The Spirit set specific terms saying that in latter times some, not all, but some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and teachings of demons. Now if you're wondering when the latter times began, the latter times began when Jesus went back to heaven. When the disciples were all standing there and the cloud had received Jesus and it was going up into the sky and the disciples just kept standing there and standing there and finally a couple of angels came and said, Hey, what are you guys looking at? He's going to come back the same way. So you need to get busy. You need to get with it. Well, just as much as the latter times began then, we are living at the end of those latter times. And evil goes through cycles of making itself known and then going underground. That's why we have all these wars. World War I, World War II. There's pieces, sections of peace in between them. But, uh, but they, they keep coming back. The cycles of evil that we are experiencing today are more intense than they have ever been. I'll give you an example. I just learned this the other day. Congress now it has refused to swear in anybody giving testimony. Uh, they are, they, the Congress will not swear them in with any reference to God. In other words, Congress has removed God from the uh, oath. Yeah, the oaths. Congress has just removed God. Of course, we know that Congress doesn't have the authority to remove God. God's still here. Okay. Now, you might ask, why would God allow all of these things to go on? And, of course, people do ask that. Why does God allow it? I want you to turn to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 26 and 27. And we're breaking into the middle of a verse here, and he's, and he's saying, whose voice, and that's God's voice, whose voice shook the earth then, but now he has promised, saying, yet once more, I shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. 
but the yet once signifies the removing of the things shaken as having been made or created in order that the things not shaken may remain. You see what's going on here. God shook the earth in Noah's day. God shook the earth with the apostles and the message of the gospel. But God is saying, I'm going to shake the earth one more time, but it's not just the earth, I'm going to shake the heaven too. And of course, we can read about that in Revelation, where it says that there was no place found for Hasatan or his demons or his fellow fallen angels, and he fell to earth. And his wrath was great because he knew that his time was short. God's going to shake the heaven empty of evil. I know it's hard to imagine that there's something evil in heaven, but Satan can still go there. And God's going to shake him out. Matthew chapter 13, Jesus gave this parable. And I find this interesting too. In verse 24, he starts and he's telling this parable to his disciples. He says, He put before them another parable saying, The kingdom of heaven has become like to a man sowing good seed in his field. But while the men slept, his enemy came and sowed darnel in the midst of the wheat and went away. And when the blade sprouted and produced fruit, then the darnel also appeared. And the bondmen of the master of the house, having come to him, said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? From whence does it have darnel? That's an important question. Where did the bad seed come from? And he said to them, A man, an enemy, did this. And the bondmen say to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, No, lest gathering the darnel you should uproot the wheat with them. I want you to listen carefully here. Allow both to grow together until the harvest. You see, that's the end of the age, is the harvest. The time that we're in is the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the harvest men, and notice this, first, gather up the darnel, not the wheat, the darnel. Get the weeds together. Get the weeds. Bind them in bundles to burn them up. But gather the wheat into my granary. Folks, with all the stuff that we see happening in our world, whether it's far, far from home or it's right here in this country, we are seeing the darnel showing itself. And according to this, it's going to get gathered up and bound and burned. Standing implies to defend yourself or to defend what's important to you. Jesus did the offensive work on the cross. And if you want to know how, you say, well, what do you mean offense? Well, there's defense and there's offense. Offense is where you score. Defense is where you keep the other guy from scoring. So, Offensively, Jesus scored for you and for me.
What are we to do? We are to defend his score. Defend the gospel. Tell other people that don't know him how to come to know him. That's our job. That's our work. <clears throat> Jude verse 3 says, Beloved, using all diligence to write to you about the common salvation... I had necessity, I had to write to you, exhorting to contend earnestly for the faith once delivered to the saints. Now the only person who can reflect Christ's love in an unhappy and troubled world is the saint that is so standing, contending for the faith. And I'm going to tell you, that is a happy saint. That person that has come to know Christ and is telling people that, look, you're lost. And you need to repent and you need to come and ask Jesus to be your Savior. That is a happy saint. Now, the world doesn't like to hear that. They're unhappy because they're lost. The last thing that standing implies is victory. You may have heard of a show on TV called Last Man Standing. Uh, that comes from an old idea. That the last person that's involved in a battle, if, if he's the only one standing, that's the side that won. That's the side that won. The one where they're standing. Victory. Standing is victory. If you try to match wits with the enemy, if you're, if, as a Christian, if you want to try to match wits with Satan, you are going to lose. If you're going to depend on yourself to win the battle, you're going to lose. You need to understand that Satan is already defeated. Jesus defeated him on the cross. The only way that he can defeat you and me is by tricking us to trust in ourselves instead of God. God is truth. Satan is a liar. And if you find people that are lying on the news or in the government, you are finding a person that works for the enemy. They're on their team. That which is false is not real. It's a sham. It's fake, as we have heard so much about fake news. How well does a sham hold up against that which is real? It doesn't. You and I must stand on what God has declared to be unchangeable. The enemy is like, uh, you remember the Snidely Whiplash? The, uh, the, the characters in the old westerns uh, tied the woman to the railroad tracks, uh, tried all kinds of devilish schemes to, to do something bad to somebody. And then... He is turned around and he is defeated by his own schemes. That's the devil. What did Snidely Whiplash used to say? Curses foiled again. Curses foiled again, right. With his mustache. Curses foiled again. The power of darkness put Jesus on the cross. And he said, oh, I've got him now. And when Jesus died, he said, oh, he's dead, it's over with. But three days later, Jesus rose from the dead. Curses foiled forever. Satan was foiled forever. 
God wants to change people that don't realize that Satan's foiled. There are people who remain defeated by the enemy. They are like Jacob was when he was wrestling against God. They don't realize that their struggles not with God, but with the enemy. You know what you need to do? You need to do what Jacob did after his hip was thrown out of joint. Start clinging to God. Cling to Him. Don't wrestle with Him. Cling to Him. Revelation 12, 11 says this, And they overcame Him, the, the accuser, Satan, they overcame Him by reason of the blood of the Lamb and by reason of the word of their testimony and love not their life unto death. That is how you have victory. Let us pray. Father, we ask that you would show us in our own lives how to have victory every day, every moment, and show us that Satan is foiled forever. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.